All right, up next from California. We're bringing back Lisa again because she did so good the last time. And this time she's going to talk to us about fleet optimization. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. This is a, a presentation that I adapted. Uh, Henry Knipe in the room um, asked me to co-present with him at um, the APWA conference back in I think it was April or May. I'm going to talk about fleet optimization in Caltrans and basically our, our focus on utilization. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Caltrans fleet and why we needed to make a change, what our goals of the program were, and what I think are our keys to success. And even though this is focusing on utilization, it's more optimization is more than just usage and then I'll hit on some of the results that we've seen. So we operate in um, 12 different districts across the state and we have many different um, user groups as many of you have. We have over 12,000 mobile fleet units and we have um, a diverse fleet like many of you, about 310 different types of asset types. And this last um, piece on here, this external oversight is really important to why we're doing what we're doing. So I'll explain a little bit more about that later. We had the Tahoe wake up call and this is not waking up in Lake Tahoe. So in 2015, we um, purchased some new Chevy Tahoes and um, let me just add that because we have this external oversight and we have it in legislation that SUVs and four-wheel drives require a lot of justification. Four-wheel drive SUVs, SUVs in general, highly prized in the department. So in 2015, we put these into service and, you know, a few months in or almost a year in, we decided to run some reports to um, see how they were, um, how they were doing. We were surprised to find that we had many of the new Tahoes were just about to mile out of the warranty. They were just running the wheels off of them. Or we had others that were hardly getting used at all. Some executives said, well, that's a simple problem. You just take the report and fold it in two and you swap the high for the low, right? That simple, easy peasy. And we all know that things are not so simple. And so lessons learned from that is we had, we had bought two-wheel drive Tahoes, and you can't swap two-wheel drive Tahoes for four-wheel drive Tahoes when somebody really needs a four-wheel drive. And we also learned that um, there was really no written formal authority for the division of equipment to move equipment around. Another reason we were focusing on this is that um, we had previously been through an externally mandated fleet reduction. And our leadership at the time was very good about communicating this upward that we, we hadn't learned our lesson. We still had a lot of underutilized vehicles in the fleet. And um, he was very good at communicating that we were at risk. Having underutilized vehicles in the fleet was a risk because we were at risk of losing them and, at least worse for us in the division of equipment, we would lose the associated resources. Um, in the prior fleet reduction, we lost about 10% of the fleet, and we lost about 25% of our fleet replacement. That's finance math, and we lost about 41 positions. So we did not want that to happen again. So the overall goals of our optimization program were to meet the retention criteria, and this is, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I call this retention criteria the floor. This is like the least amount of usage you need to have on a vehicle in order to justify continuing to own it. So at, at the beginning, we were focusing this on light duty, and everything that you see in this presentation with an asterisk was added as we got into the second and third year of this program and came out of the Lean Six Sigma um, project. So now we're focusing on meeting the retention criteria for the, for the heavy duty fleet or the non-light duty, which is the off-road and the heavy duty truck. We also wanted to level the usage and manage and maximize our warranties. And we also wanted to get delegated authority, we wanted to get our house in shape so that we could get delegated authority to approve and plan our own fleet acquisitions without having to go to an external entity. 
you can see the slides change to a different color green. <laughs> um, green is um, for Lean Six Sigma because when you complete your uh, training, you get a green belt. So this is, I have about four, four slides on Lean Six Sigma. I will try to keep it short and not get into too much detail, but if you want to linger here, you know, stop me and let me know. But So we did a Lean Six Sigma um, process on this optimization program that we had. We have a team that, of people that are close to the process. We want to make the process more efficient, less wasteful, and improve the quality of the process. And when I went through my Lean Six Sigma training, our, our teacher always was talking about, you start open, narrow, close. You, you look at the big picture, you drill down in data and you come to a very closed focus solution. So that's the open, narrow, closed. You, um, in Lean Six Sigma, you spend a lot of time at the beginning mapping out the different steps in the process. It's a data-driven process as well. And at the end, you have a control plan because you've gone through all this work. Um, you don't want the, pro the problems or the process to unravel and go back to the prior state. So that's a little bit about Lean Six Sigma. And in Lean Six Sigma, this acronym is called DEMAIC. Um, these are the, the cycle when you go through a Lean Six Sigma um, process. You're defining the problem, you're measuring it, you're, you're taking lots of data, whatever data you can find um, to give you an indication of where you're at, uh, how your process is performing. You analyze, and Bob is a green belt as well, so pipe in at any time. And then you look, so oftentimes when you get a group together, they immediately want to start, they, they want to jump to solutions. Um, but if you really don't analyze and baseline and measure, you might be doing a solution that's not really going to um, affect how your process um, performs. And then the last step is, is control. This is um, the value stream. You're mapping the process and looking for the steps in the process that are wasteful and where, what are the steps in the process that are adding value. And I really just want to point out um, a couple of things here that one of the, in this optimization process, which is all about moving vehicles so they can get better usage on them, one of the biggest areas of waste was right in here where we have this VET data. We get, we would get a usage report and we have, has the usage on it, but we don't know how much downtime that vehicle had. We don't know if it was moved last month and we don't know the reliability of that. So there was a lot of waste in this area. So we definitely wanted to address that. The red boxes is where there's a lot of waste. So you have some um, waste over here as well. This is kind of decision authority churn. I'll just characterize it as that, that even after we figured out, yes, the data is correct and we need to move this vehicle, um, different, different manager levels are looking at this and they're putting on the brakes or you know, roadblocks, et cetera. So it took a long time, even though we know the vehicle now needs to be moved and we have the data, we're having authority problems or, or resistance, if you will. That's one of the things we did is first map out the problem to try to find you know, where, where, the, where the problems are. And then we, Lean Six Sigma is all about measuring and getting data, whatever you can on your process. And so we had um, reporting and so we're looking at all of our, our fleet and putting it in these categories and we're looking for, um, this is a Pareto chart, where's the biggest problem? And so our light duty fleet was looking pretty good. Our heavy duty fleet was not really the problem, but this other category, this is where we're um, finding you know, a lot of vehicles that were not, they were well below this standard. So then we keep, this is open, narrow, closed, so we keep, um, I feel like a professor almost. Um, so we keep drilling down and we're looking now, okay, even further down into this other category. And so we're looking at the top three types of equipment that are, are driving this problem. It's landscape maintenance equipment, is road maintenance equipment, and trailers. So now we know where our problems are of uh, equipment that's not, not being used. I mentioned that we have this retention criteria, and this is what I call the floor. And this is not the replacement criteria in any way 
um, any form at all. This is like the least amount you need to be using this vehicle in, other, in order to justify owning it. And so these are externally determined, 6,000 miles or 125 hours for our equipment or 125 days. And it, this applies to both light duty and heavy duty. Some of the keys to our success, um, we have implemented telematics in all of our fleet. We've had it now five years, you think? Maybe about five years, so long before we did the Lean Six Sigma. This is by far very fundamental to our success to be able to more, what I say, more actively manage our fleet. We were managing our fleet before, but now we have good, accurate data. It's not infallible, but it's accurate, it's automatic, and it's difficult to dispute. So that was very important to get into where we needed to be. Other keys to our success is getting some kind of formal written authority in the division of equipment. So we had this sense of ownership of, of different organizations or different um, units in the organization. So after the Tahoe wake-up call, a formal delegation was given to my boss, Bob Myers now, although not many people really see that. That really just goes from his boss to him, and uh, like the rest of the department doesn't care, doesn't know about it. You know, we, we spout it, we, we cite it. So that was helpful in some regards, but in 2018, um, we have these deputy directives that um, do get distributed to the whole department. And there's one that's been around for years on the use of state vehicles. Well, kind of surprising to us when the new version came out, it had a lot of stuff in there about optimization and, and the staff that we have in place to, and the delegated authority for that. That was an improvement over the 2015. But we're planning on doing a specific directive just on optimization. And that's a recommendation that came out of the Lean Six Sigma, you can see the asterisk down there, and that is to kind of get rid of that waste where you saw we have resistance in that process map of people that don't want to, even though the data is there, and they still want to put up roadblocks. So this would be kind of like the final piece to get that delegation widely known or that authority widely known in the department. Other keys to success is that we've put resources on this. Um, it's a full-time job. Each district, we have 12 operating districts, has a fleet optimization manager that, report, that um, reports to the district, not to the division of equipment. Sometimes they're in, under the admin umbrella or deputy, sometimes they're under maintenance. Um, in any case, they, um, they're looking at what's going on, they're looking at reports for helping to manage and move equipment within their district. And this has question marks because at the time that I did this slide, we didn't have a permanent employee in the position, um, somebody retired, and I had 11 candidates apply for this job. So this kind of tells you a little bit about the culture. Um, this is not a popular job. This is the job where I come and take your vehicle away. It can be contentious. It can be political. I had many candidates, difficult choice to make, but we finally have gotten um, a, a person in there. And next time you see this presentation, George Edwards' picture will be in there. So Another key to the, our success in this area is the reporting. And again, this, this has the asterisk, so this came out of the Lean Six Sigma. We have this report, comes out monthly. I'm going to call it here the one and done report. Um, it's also called the FOUR report, the Fleet Optimization Utilization Report, F-O-U-R. This report, you saw in that process map of all of the waste in that vet data step, this is the one and done report. It accounts for downtime and the thresholds that you need to hit that floor are proportionally reduced by the amount of days of downtime. So. Um, it takes away that argument that it was down. Well, it was down, but we lowered the target for you based upon that downtime. It also, this report also identifies the high and the low. So we have a tab on the report that has the top 5%, the top and the lowest 5%. This identifies opportunities for swapping high and low equipment. It also captures past moves. So if you see something on there, that's not meeting the standard, you can see that, well, it was moved last month, so it hasn't had a chance 
to really excel in its new assignment. If you find data that's incorrect in this report, there's a feature to click on it and send an email right from there and you can, and that goes to the source of the person who created the report so the correction can get made at the source and not you having to fix it every month when you get the report. So again, that's reducing the waste. Another nickname for this report is called the shopping list because this is what the fleet optimization managers do, the farms in the district. They have somebody in their district that comes to them and says, we just hired a new crew, I need three pickups, I need them yesterday. They go to this usage report, the four report, they filter for that particular piece of equipment, and they look in their district who's not using theirs, because now they can go get it, or if it's not in their district, they can look statewide and they can make a request to get that piece of equipment right there. So there's a lot of transparency and you can look and see what the rest of the state is doing and you can find the asset that you need. Another key to our success, as you saw when we looked at that data and, the, and what's driving um, the usage numbers to be low, the trailers, the maintenance, the landscape equipment, I can't remember what all that was, but what we were able to do with our external regulator is make the case that many um, types, asset types, these things should, these kinds of thresholds are not applicable. So we have this exception list, we call it the ESVD list, it's the emergency, seasonal, and variable demand. And so we have a spreadsheet, and you, it's not a free for all, get out of jail free, you just put the asset on there and call it good and move on. Probably about seven or eight different critical questions have to be answered sent to our regulator and it gets approved to be on this ESVD list. And then um, we still monitor and manage that equipment, but it does not go into our calculation of whether we meet as, a, as an agency the percentage of, of, of utilization. And I mentioned at the beginning that much of this is utilization management, but it's more than that. And so another key to our success is standardizing equipment. And some, I think Kyle mentioned it this morning. So we, are, we reduced the number of asset types that we have. I think we had, how many, Chris? Over 500, 550, we're now down to 310. We're looking for equipment that can do multiple things. So those of you that were in San Diego a few years back, um, we, um, our four yards and 10 yard trucks were doing roll off bodies. We're looking at getting integrated tool carriers instead of loaders. So we've standardized like the asset type offerings that we're doing. And then we're also standardizing the options that do come on the different types of assets that we have. And as I mentioned, we've reduced the number of asset types that we basically offer our users. What happened? We've done all of this. What, what, what was the result? So, come on. Done wrong. Done wrong. There we go. Okay. So we've moved or reassigned over a thousand um, pieces of equipment. And this is old information. I'm sure that this has been, this is higher now. And we've, um, we put many more, or, or units are creating their own pools where if they, it was an, a remote office and everybody had their own vehicle, now they know that they, they created these little mini pools or, or other equipment has gone into, they've moved it from a unit to the auto pool. So a um, lot, of, lot of that type of movement. We actually reduced the number of assets from 603, according to one of your staff, Chris, <coughs> down to 310. We went from 28 different types of plow trucks down to four or five, if you count the CNG version of a plow truck that we have. And we reduced the types of SUVs down to four, four different kinds of passenger cars. We're also, for pickups, we're either doing three quarter tons or, or half tons, all extended cabs. Every dump truck has a roll off and either comes with a plow and a spreader or is plow or spreader ready? Um, so that we, if we have a, a truck that's in the valley, doesn't have a plow or a spreader, but it has the controls, if we need to move it up to the mountains or for a storm, moves right up there, plug in the plow, put on the spreader, go, go plow some snow. And all of our front snow plows are the same for both of our um, 10 yard and our um, four yard truck. This is a quarterly reporting that we do on the light duty fleet only, and this is part of the um, department's 
externally or uh, performance measures. So this does not include all of our uh, heavy duty. Um, at the time this was put together, that, that was not required. But you can see like basically what gets measured gets done and we have a few se seasonal fluctuations, but we're on kind of a, a, a slight upward trend, so we're doing good there. And this is a screenshot of the one and done report. And right when you open it up on the um, main page, you're gonna see where, this is like the dashboard. This is where we're at. We have statewide of our assets that count. Uh, we're at 96.73% that are meeting the floor. Um, and right there is that click here to report a data issue that I talked about, like if you find an error, we don't want you to have to deal with that error every month. Let's click it and report it and get it corrected at the source. And then there's a, uh, our web page. And then this is the, uh, a quarterly breakdown of what the floor criteria is that we need to meet. And so, in summary, we've, um, we've been pretty successful here. We've done a lot of changes. We're changing our composition, and we're changing the culture, which I will still, it's in, in process. I don't know if that ever totally gets changed. We are getting, I said that we're externally, we have external oversight, so we're more readily getting our purchases approved. It's still a very onerous process, and um, potentially, if we um, keep doing what we're doing, we'll get a delegation that we do not have to go external to get our fleet um, um, purchases or plans approved, which doesn't sound like much, but let me tell you, it, it is a very onerous process. It's every single asset, probably answering 10 or 12 questions. It goes from my office to Bob, to Bob's boss, to our director, to our agency secretary. Then it goes over to the Department of General Services, it goes to the analyst there, it goes to the division chief there, it goes to the director of DGS, sometimes it goes to the agency director over there, and that takes, can take a year, <laughs> literally. If we can get our act together and keep our act together and be able to basically do our plan, my staff does it, and I'll take it to Bob, and Bob will sign it, and we'll be done. So that's our, that's, that's the carrot for us to do all this. So um, that's my contact information. Any questions, um, comments? Not trailers um, at this time. Um, we had some devices there, but uh, and um, trailers do not uh, have to get uh, meet that floor like um, like other assets do. So the trailers are not days, and it's in the IMMS system, our integrated maintenance management system. If someday, if we come up with a good solution that doesn't cost a lot of money and the batteries go dead, um, we'll, we'll put some tracking on them, but right now we're not. Thanks for that clarification. <laughs> well, currently, it is network fleet, um, but we are in the process. We're actually, we've gone through the RFP process and um, have a new vendor coming on board and they're doing, they're required to do a proof of concept and um, it is Geotab. And here's the wrong logo again. So. <laughs> thank you again to our host and thank you. It's getting easier and the Lean Six Sigma process um, project is, hasn't completed and implemented all of their solutions. So they still need to um, put out the deputy directive, um, which will um, you know, give really very formal authority to the fleet optimization managers. Um, but the, the, the fleet optimization managers right now are pointing to that um, uh, 2018 directive on use of state vehicles, that helps. Um, it also helps that from the very beginning of this, um, two directors ago, um, our director, it was top down, we, we got a lot of support and backing from them because they understand that if we um, continue to have underutilized vehicles, we're at risk of losing even more vehicles. Um, so. It, it's changing, um, and uh, we have, I, I've had somebody, it's been a long process to get this position filled, um, and I've, I've had somebody acting in that position um, that has done a great job, 
Um, she takes people's vehicles away. They're, they seem to like her. She gives them a bagel and they're happy. So, um, the repo she, lady. yeah, the repo lady. She, she, uh, and we had, uh, she's the second person to be in that job. The first person had very much of a, I'm taking it, you're not using it, end of conversation. Um, that was um, uh, Ron, the repo Don. Um, yeah, and so then we had Gail, um, Gail Sparkman, who's been, um, she actually comes from admin, and she was doing an out of class for several months. She had a whole different style. It's like, we're a team, and just, uh, you just hardly, you can't stay mad at her, and she just, um, but she's persistent, and um, like I said, she would bring you cookies and take your keys. Um, so, uh, and so now we're going to have someone else in the job, and they'll have to find their own style um, uh, and, and way of doing business. Well, we, when we got um, Network Fleet, uh, it, it, was, it was easy to get them on board. There happened to be a WISCA contract, or the Western States Contracting Alliance. And um, actually, Verizon was on the contract, and we were able to quickly move and get them on. So that was like our first four way, foray into the telematics, and that we were able to do it quickly. It was what it was. Um, there were some, especially for our um, uh, electric vehicles and even like our plug-in hybrid vehicles, um, the telematics didn't work right on them. It would show that they were... Um, driving on the weekend when they never moved, so there was um, some problems. I mean, it's still much accurate, more accurate data than we had any other source, but um, we also didn't have, we, we took the terms of the contract the way the WISCA contract was. There, there was not any um, uh, requirements that we had put together from an RFP where you know, the power's in the pin when you write a contract, right? Well, this is like we just took, we just bought them off Wiska and headed out the door. And that, that's what we needed at the time. And so through learning, you know, with reporting and we want this kind of service and et cetera, you know, um, we learned that and that's what um, informed our development of our scope of work. I've heard of that type of thing. Um, and at some point, um, now that we have, when we have a new provider, I think we're going to use some business intelligent and kind of look for that type of thing. That, that's, I, I see that as probably like the next um, level of sophistication in reporting and look, looking for that type of thing. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.